like I said, I'm really happy to be here, etc. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> so that's that's that, that's clear. Um, um, so yeah, just think about like if if we want to think so like from an activist perspective, which is which is the sort of segue that I take into philosophy is that it's okay to be completely activist, and if you're open about that, that's 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 how I want to formulate my thinking for a different kind of world, right? And um, my interest in memory and the past also comes through that. And I think it's something maybe that you would see right now is, for example, there's a lot of talk and I, I mean, maybe you disagree actually because you're in many different places. So this is always, right, when I talk about, oh, you see right now, just take the you very broad and be critical with me, that's completely okay. And say like, oh, this is actually not in our context. Um, we'll just leave some time at the end and be like, yeah, no. But what I tend to see is that people are saying like, oh, this is going to change everything. So the COVID-19 crisis is going to change everything. And from now on, the world is never going to be the same. But to me, when I look into the newspaper, for example, or uh, looking online or looking who is speaking about this current time and who is analyzing this current time, I'm not seeing different voices from usual. So while we're continuously talking about that, this enormous change that's going to happen, I'm wondering how is this change going to happen if the infrastructures of who gets to speak and who gets to think about what is happening are not really fundamentally changing at all. And this is also why I'm interested in, um, in the past. Um, because if we have a certain, and writing the past, right? Keep this writing in your head. And we will talk about some strategies today. That's basically what I'll be doing is to, speak, to share some strategies of pluralizing the past, of creating a multi-voiced, polyvocal, to say it, polyvocal um, uh, a narration of the past. Because what I think is that if, and I don't think this alone, we will see that I'm, I'm going to be citing a lot of different philosophers and thinkers and feminists, black feminists uh, mostly, and artists, um, which is also for me another strategy, continuously working with and alongside other people, um, whether that being physically or together like this. Um, but if we have a singular narration of the past, how do we expect there will be a plural future in which there is space for different kinds of being, for different kinds of life? Um, so that's basically what I want to share today with you. Is this kind of rewriting of history that allows us to create a plural past? Does that make sense so far? Just doing it like that, great. Um, so I'll share my screen with you. Let's see if that goes well. I think it does. Perfect. It's working amazing. Great, I, I practiced this actually. <laughs> <laughs> but now I need to just do the most simple thing. Start the, I never know why this is. I think it's uh, uh, yeah. So you're seeing this, right? This is the book that I just held up. Um, and I'm starting with that book because actually it's probably a better introduction than the, the bio that Nelly was going to read to this discourse today. Um, because it, it already sort of talks about some of these strategies that I, that I hope to evoke. And then we will move into some examples of other people's work that will show this sort of polyvocal strategizing of rewriting. And then we even go, let's see, yeah, there you go. Um, so first talking about creating counter narratives in historical writing or in, for example, events that are already there. And then going into also this idea of creating the future. So here people often think about sci-fi, for example, that's the most obvious genre where we move towards writing the future. Um, we imagine a completely different technology, for example, um, that is created, creating a, uh, a very outer world. Um, and while I also love that genre, I'm going to be talking about different kinds of future writing. So here's going to be creating the future, representing the present. 
um, and then predicting the future as a healing practice, which is a, uh, a small exercise I want to end off with. This is just, <laughs> this is the most structured I, I usually talk um, because it feels just so strange without body. So I thought I would implement so, some structure in case you cannot trust me just by being positively bodily present with me. Um, now I'm just gonna be like, structure, it's gonna give you trust, I don't know. It's a wrong thought maybe. Um, so here you go. Um, Herdenke Herdacht, this is the book that I wrote about commemoration and, and trying to formulate different ways of commemorating. Um, I start speaking about st straight time um, and straight time is the idea that time sort of just passes on. Something that happens in the current moment um, ha will also happen in the future. It has a lineage. So if uh, Sedgwick, for example, gives this example of straight time where she says, uh, my father had it, his father had it, I have it, my son will have it, and his son will have it. Right, so if you think about the family, family structure, you already have this sort of, this sort of um, straight time because it's a passing on. This is also what is, of course, the purpose of the family is that you, for example, accumulate some wealth and you pass that wealth on. So I hope it makes sense that straight time is this, is this reproduction of the present into the future. And straight time is something I would wish to break. Because what it means is that if I'm speaking now, and if I'm speaking about this one thing that I find interesting, my son will also speak about this, and his son will also speak about this, meaning that nothing will really, really change. And I'm, of course, using son and father here uh, because of the patriarchal or the, the, the patriarchal notion that it, that it comes with, uh, this idea of passing on. Um, so I started with analyzing this idea of like, okay, so if we just continue, and if we continue with the current stu structures that have this straight time in them, because they're aimed at reproducing from the present, then we need something else. And this is the moment that I introduce queer forgetfulness, which I don't know, can you see me still? Or you only see my shared screen? You can see, great, thank you for the thumbs up. Um, queer forgetfulness, just holding up Jack Halberstam's uh, book, the queer art of failure. Um, I'm only doing this holding of books because I really like the tangibility of books. Um, he talks about queer forgetfulness um, because what queer forgetfulness would mean is that it refers to um, forgetting. It refers to histories that have been forgotten. So the histories of queer people, LGBTQ people have been forgotten. They have not been part of uh, dominant or mainstream history. So this is a form of forgetting. But there's also another sort of more willful uh, queer forgetfulness where a queer person deliberately forgets how things should be done. So a queer, queer time or queer forgetfulness breaks this idea of straight time where things just reproduce as they are supposed to be, this kind of passing on. And instead, queer forgetfulness forgets to behave. It forgets to comply with the rules that are out there that tell us how we should behave, how we should want to live, for example. So, and I'm talking about queer as a radicality here. I'm not talking about people sleeping with the same sex. Um, I'm talking about queer as a methodology, right? So this is, of course, not, I cannot in any way claim that this is true for people who have same-sex relationships, um, really talking about queer as a, as a methodology. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think if it's, if I should say some more about forgetfulness. So it, it, it's an attempt while, while forgetting happens to you, from being in marginalized positions, for example, your queerness can be forgotten. Black histories are forgotten. Indigenous histories are forgotten. Forgetfulness can also be a strategy. 
to break the lineage of compliance, to break the lineage of normative behavior. A queer forgets to build a family and to pass on an accumulation of wealth. So here you also see how queer forgetfulness is, for example, an anti-capitalist strategy. Because um, to remember is also a way to accumulate wealth and to pass wealth on. In order to accumulate wealth, you, for example, need memory. You need to have a contract and you need to remember the contract in order to, uh, to say that something is yours. So to claim property also comes again with memory. And this forgetfulness can actually dismantle this claiming of property, this claiming of saying that this is a promise, this is what I have, um, what I'm entitled to get. So this is something that I, that I sketch out. What do we would think from queer forgetfulness? In, instead of thinking that we have to remember everything, what would happen if we forget? Would this give us a, a radical potential of creating a different future? Instead of focusing on commemoration in the sense of we have to, um, we have to remember so that this memory of an event, a historical event, formulates our future. Instead it says, what if we would not remember anything? then we would almost have like a clean sheet creating a future. But then I also go into how this is problematic actually. So I, I first built this argument, but then also talking about that it's actually problematic because there's also an element of whiteness in there. Um, because it's easier to say that it's okay to forget everything when everything around you affirms and confirms your existence. So as a white person in the Netherlands, my history is represented everywhere. I don't even have to go look for it. I don't even have to identify with it. It's already present. All of the statues in the city represent the history of my ancestors. They were colonizers. It's not a, it's not a pretty history, but it's so present that it does not need to be questioned. And I also don't need to go look for it. It's, it's an affirmation of my existence. So then I go to, I'm just trying to see if I see the book here. I'm going to Saidia Hartman, who we will encounter a bit later as well. So I will also make sure to, she's also in the, um, uh, in the notes of this, this class. So you can find all the references there too. And um, Saidia Hartman writes in Lose Your Mother how she goes and looks for her ancestors. So she's an African-American scholar living in New York and she thinks but she doesn't know that her family is from Ghana and she goes and visits Ghana then talks about the complications of that because there's a lot of tourism there uh, looking for uh, enslaved ancestry etc. But the, the main argument that I'm pointing out right now is that she's talking about um, the complete obsession with your history when your history is not around. When you do not know your history, you're becoming obsessed with reconstructing this history, trying to find it. And um, as you see, I first argue for this queer forgetfulness. Right? I think, oh, it's great. You, you break the lineage then there's a possibility for a different future. But then I talk about how queer forgetfulness is also, at the same time, a form of white privilege, or is at least complicated by the notion of whiteness, and the, the sort of continuous presence of your history. So it's easy to say, like, oh, let's forget, if it's not forgotten already. Does that make sense? Thank you for the knocks. Um, also going into, this is another strategy that we will see in the, in the work that I will share with you, is um, thinking from abundance. Um, here I quote Evan Ifakoya, as you can see on the slide. He, uh, they ask, um, what if we would think from abundance instead of scarcity? It's this idea that Often when we talk about memory and commemoration, we say that there's only so much time, or there's only so much space, sorry. There's only so much space to remember. 
we can only have a few national commemoration, commemoration days because we could not have free from our work every single day, right? We could not uh, have a celebration uh, of the liberation, for example, uh, which we have in the Netherlands, which is 4 and 5th of May. It's liberation, it's called Liberation Day um, uh, in 1945. The, the end of the Second World War. This is a national commemoration day and everybody gets off from their work. So when we talk about, we need to add histories. We need more histories to be remembered and to be commemorated. There's also this pushback from a perspective of scarcity where it's saying like, well, but we cannot commemorate everything. We cannot have a statue for everyone. And what I try to argue from basically in actually all my work, but especially when it comes to memory, and it's really difficult because I also do not, do not inhabit this argument. And this is actually why I think it's really interesting, is to think from the perspective of abundance. So to never allow yourself to say like, oh, but we only have so much space, or we are not able, we are not physically capable to remember everything. While we can argue about the, the actuality of that, the neurological actuality, for example, right? Like this is often, there's a lot of study on memory right now from a neurological, uh, biological perspective. I'm just saying I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in accepting these limits beforehand because they, they tie in with a, with a history of speaking from scarcity thinking from scarcity, which also ties in with an economic history. We can go to Malthus, we can go to Darwin. It's only so much that survives, mutation. Sorry if this is confusing. I will just drop that argument like there. Um, so thinking from abundance, what if, I, what if I imagine it possible that I could commemorate and I could have space for all histories and stories. And then um, this abundance, to make it more concrete, I will, I will share some, some examples of what this abundance can mean. Um, for example, at the bottom of the slide, you will see accumulation of details and mismatching senses. We will get to that, I will first um, that's a form of abundance, but you will see. Um, I'm also going into the question of medium. So what are the ways, or form, what are the ways through which we commemorate? So this is why I wrote, what can a statue tell us? So what we see with the current adding of histories, with the current what could be called the emancipation of a more plural historical narration of the idea that the narration of history becomes more diverse and that there's more space for more vo different voices instead of having just a white masculine narration, heterosexual narration of history, is that you will see that um, there are sort of celebrations of um, recognition such as this is why I included Marsha P. Johnson. Um, she's getting now a, sta a statue at the, um, in front of Stonewall Cafe in the Greenwich Village in New York City. I don't know if you know about Marsha P. Johnson, but she uh, was very much uh, involved in the Stonewall Uprise in 1969. And um, this, of course, uh, tumbled or uh, made the LGBTQ movement uh, more visible at the one hand and um, uh, yeah, claimed a lot of rights um, or it was a continuous protest. And with the 50th anniversary, which was 2019 of the Stonewall um, uh, uprise, which is of course, again, the Stonewall riot is of course a very US North American history. Um, so it's, it's also that is narrow, but uh, the narration of the Stonewall rioting was often, and which also resulted into pride and pride celebrations, was often told from a white, masculine, uh, gay perspective. And Marsha P. Johnson was uh, potentially a, a trans woman, 
a woman of color. And her history has been told more and more lately. Um, and now there is the, uh, the promise of putting up a statue of Marsha P. Johnson in the Stonewall Park in Greenwich Village, New York. And while this is, this is, and this is completely a celebration of again, like, oh, there's finally histories are being recognized, right? So this is what you could see as a success in terms of pluralizing history. But I also have a question about the form in which we commemorate. What can a statue tell us? Does a statue really disrupt our daily surround or daily context? Does it disrupt enough to tell us a counter narrative, to tell us a different history? The form of a statue has always had a certain idea of hierarchy in it. You look up to a statue, it's never looking down. You look up, it's an elevated, alleviated, an elevated um, form of history telling, but it's also inorganic. So it just stands, it doesn't change shape. It doesn't speak, it's not loud, it's not dirty, it's very contained and it's never disruptive, right? It doesn't shout at you when you walk by, it's not like, hey, listen to my history. So there's this question of what forms are we using? Are we, when we celebrate the fact that a counter narrative is commemorated and is put in a dominant and mainstream almost form or a traditional form such as a statue do we then just include in the dominant history and in the dominant narration and should we not think about other way other forms um so for example what i propose in herdenke herdacht uh the book is to since there's a lot of taking down of statues at the moment um, because they, they represent colonial histories, I wonder whether, for example, and it's just a really small proposition, uh, is to destruct those statues, but not by taking them away in a clean sense, as they are being taken away right now, um, but by destructing them and dismantling them and having the, the rubbish the stone, how do you say that, the stone rubbish <laughs> of the statues still around. And then you get to the argument again of like, but, but hey, but that would disrupt the way. For example, people would be on their way to work and this rubbish would be in their way. And this is the moment where for me, it becomes interesting to think about commemoration. What if we allow commemoration and an engagement with the past to be a complete disruption of our daily way, of our daily route, of our daily life. Instead of having this sort of contained, clean, boxed form of dealing with the past. Why, is it, why, why would we not be slipping, slipping over it? Why, wouldn't we, why would it not be slippery that we would fall over it in that sense, trip over it? So then you start thinking about what kind of forms of narration could we use? And this is also a question, of course, that I'm posing to you, whatever your practice is. This is a question maybe always to ask is this question of in what ways am I, in, am I, Am I getting so close to the, to the dominant way of telling a story that there's no element of disruption at all anymore? Hmm. Another aspect that I introduce is um, in the preface actually of the book is the idea of the goddesses, is that I thank the goddesses uh, for alongside me in, in, the, in the book. And this is a way it's, it's actually a very, it's, you could think of it as a spiritual practice. Um, you could also see it as a very concrete proposition where it is never possible to reference everyone that your thinking is building on. 
right? I have a lot of references as I send you the references for this class that are very clear. You know, I'm mentioning these people, Jack Halberstam, Evan Ifakoya. You can look them up because I'm quoting them, for example. But all of these other tensions, intentions, energies, attentions that create even the possibility of speaking a sentence, that's what I call the goddesses. And it's, it's funny because it's both a humbling practice because it's both saying that I do not speak in a singular sense. I'm always supported by all these other voices and these other thinkers out there. And it's also giving us a sense of security or a certain assertiveness because it also means that you're not alone or solely responsible for the thoughts that you have. And for me, this is another way of, this may not be like pluralizing history, um, but I guess it is because it, it brings in the plurality of any given moment. Because when I speak this sentence, it already carries so much in it, in itself. The language that I speak, which language is this, right? We're having this, the underground, the University of the Underground is also based on the English language. Most of us are not native speakers. What does that create in itself? Who do we reference to in a sentence? And the goddesses help me personally, they help me write, blah, blah, blah. But they also help me with this awareness that any given moment, so this presence is plural. And from understanding the presence as plural, we can also create a plural future. And again, this abundance, you might think of this already. Instead of, instead of saying like, oh, but it's too much to give account for, any, for every single goddess. It's too much. <laughs> We're saying, no, it's not. And I'm saying we now. So you see how the goddesses are working. It's not, it's not too much. There is a potential of bringing in everything that's currently making the present moment, building the present moment. Because you're also in the plural or in the goddesses, in, in, in just bringing them in the room, um, you're also giving some account, not visibility or legibility, but you're giving some account of the fact that there's also presences, there's also, uh, yeah, there's also presences that you do not know of. And here we could talk about if we had more time, <laughs> we could talk about invisible labor or effective labor, the ways that every single thing that, that supports us to be here in this present moment is important. Well, it is like, it's like having an X-ray glasses, X-ray glasses. It's like having the multiple layers that construct the current moment. That all set, uh, going to the end of the slide, accumulation of details. Um, that's just a strategy uh, that I would say comes for me from Tina Kent, who wrote Listening to Images. And she talks about the accumulation of details. So when she's talking about a photo, she works with visual, visual material. She starts describing all the details that she thinks she can see, and maybe even go beyond that a little bit. So I could describe the image that I'm seeing right now. I'm seeing Rupert, Asu Aksu, Sean Doherty, Alexandra Fahima. Okay, <laughs> that's basically all. Meriam Dersen, yeah. <laughs> um, sorry for everybody else because you're there. I know. Um, but by starting yourself in this, in this mode of accumulation, of saying that all of the details can be present, you also become aware of the things that you possibly don't see, but you might, might just make them up. So you keep adding details, you keep adding details. And by adding details, um, again, you're making the present full. So it's, it's similar to the goddesses. And this is when we talk about writing, maybe very concretely, um, I'm sure that there's completely different practices and interests uh, amongst you. 
Um, but when I think about writing, this accumulation of details um, is a very is a very good tool actually to to create this kind of abundance. Um, and again, also to claim space. Um, because it, it kind of goes against a traditional way of writing or constructing narrative or constructing an argument where with an argument you're building you're building towards a certain um, you're you're only including that which supports the argument and this is actually not for me a kind of thinking that i feel drawn by or drawn to um because there's a certain falsity to it because you're con continuously excluding elements because they do not support your argument. And there's also an idea and a conviction or a notion of clarity that is then being um, held up, right? It's this idea of like, you can only include that which supports the clarity of your argument or of your story. Um, I wrote columns for several years in a newspaper and then you have a very short, small space. And lesson one with column writing is always pick one thing to write about. And I, I just, I, I want to go against that. I would rather be illegible or unclear, um, but still try this sort of accumulation and this abundance. Then, then believing that there's only one way of communication or of legibility or of speaking to each other, where we comp continuously diselect and exclude, for example, details. So this is why I'm talking about this from this perspective of accumulation of details, is that it allows you to bring in things that might not seem important for your main argument, the red thread through an article, for example. Instead, you can include also that which does not seem important. Um, and also the mismatching of senses is another strategy. Um, listening to images already holds that in the title of the book, right? Listening to images. We are used to seeing images and not to listening to them. So putting senses like listening to the images instead of, or what else? Here, I would ask you for an example. Touching, touching air, touching oxygen, something like that. This is another, um, another strategy, I would say, where touching oxygen is not really a good example, sorry. Just stick to the listening to images. Um, is another strategy of, when we have a certain idea about how we should approach material, we might want to disrupt it. We might want to coincide it with another kind of sense. Does that make sense? So instead of looking at an image, we start listening to it. And though that might seem like a false engagement with the material, it can actually create something and it can, create, it can generate Again, an abundant response. Now I'll share something with you. Let's see if this, we're still in shared screen. Um, that lets you listen actually, but maybe you should look at it because it's a, a sound work. <laughs> um, to abundance. It's by Evan Ifekoya. It's a sound work. I will only share a minute of it. You can later look at it, uh, look at it, listen to it, uh, to the whole piece. Um, but I think it's, for example, an, a, an element, it's, it's both tying in the goddesses, the accumulation, and abundance. So I'll just let you listen to it. And then usually I would say, let's talk about it, but that's maybe a bit difficult. So there you go. Will you give me thumbs up if the sound is okay? Shannon Simpson, Grace Jones, Shannon Simpson, Pike, Gail, Rosa Parks, Marcellus, Lovecraft, Baden, Miriam McCaper, 
Jude, Jay Evans, Ifekoye, and Simone Lee, Aine Bailey, Monica Blades, Chase, Billy Holiday, Valentina, Chi Chi Monoku, Zakia Suwa, Marsha Smith, Randy Brooklyn, Heidi Lerner, Zawi, Charlie Brinkley, Jeff Kende, Kemoy Jamot, Jotty Meta, Bell Hooks, Imani Robinson, Jen Mickey McKenzie, Jane Simone, Kame Ayewa, Rosalind Jones, Rashida Phillip, June Tyson, Rashida Bombay, Amma Josephine Butch, Una Marsden, Beyonce Anu Enriquez, Valentina Jones, Alice Coltrane, Erica Virginia Wilson, Phyllis Princess Nokia, Tony Morris Hannah Black, Kachenga, Missy Elliott. So I'm going to stop it here, also because of time. We do have a scarcity of time uh, at this moment, but we should not believe in it. Um, uh, this is Evan Ifakoya. And it's a sound piece. It's a meditation. I would really recommend uh, listening to it fully or watching it. Um, and the reason that I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this with you is, of course, to um, to give some yeah to give an example of this abundance to uh, bring in the goddesses. So what they are doing is that they are reciting mostly black women and black non-binary people as a form of healing. People that have inspired them. Uh, Evan Ifakoya goes by Daydem, um, and they're bringing them into space, and they start with reciting their names, and then the reciting becomes mixed together. So there's a plural or a poly polyvocality of the voices. So the voices become uh, to overlap each other, and they actually become, in one point, illegible. So we cannot really hear the names anymore. And I think this is a good example where you choose, you choose illegibility, but abundance and overlapping continuous presence over clarity, right? Instead of having this sort of um, idea that every name should be clear, it's more of this having every name be present with each other. So this is for me a way of writing history in a plural way, where the writing of history is not about producing an argument or producing a clarity, but actually of disrupting in a way what it could look like. Um, I think one aspect of the accumulation of details that we, did, we just discussed, saying we, I know that I'm just talking, but um, is also that it's 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 saying that in a way you do not need to create a completely different future if you are already aware of all the things present in the present moment or in the past so instead of thinking of the past as a scarce and limited place because it is narrated by white men, you can also dig up all of the presences that are in the past. And this is why I'm sharing these, these strategies with you, is to sort of how to dig these up. And I think that one um, really interesting example is by Claudia Rankine and John Lucas, and it's a video, I will show it. Um, it's, good as an introduction that they take the moment of 2006 the world cup soccer world cup or football depending on where you are in the world um and um zidana zinadine zidana gives a headbutt and this was quite a historic moment <laughs> depending if you follow soccer and they take this moment and they stretch it out this few seconds that were on live television worldwide they stretch it out so here you see the element, this is another strategy, is that you do not say, okay, time has a usual natural progression. No, you say time can be many things. So if I stretch out a few seconds into a few minutes, time already becomes 
another kind of matter. Um, they stretch it out, playing with temporality, and they, they put in a cut up poem by different thinkers. And you will see there's a voiceover sort of, which is for me another way, and I really um, would be curious to hear how you are experiencing this, um, another way of rewriting history, to take this moment and to make it large and full of different voices. I will share it with you. Just give me a thumbs up if it works. Work? Something is there before us that is I'm just going to put it like this. Is neither the living person himself nor any sort of reality. Neither the same as the one who is alive nor another. What is there is the absolute calm of what has found its place. Every day I think about where I came from and I am still proud to be who I am. Big Algerian shit. Dirty terrorist, nigger. Perhaps the most insidious and least understood form of segregation is that of the word. The Algerian men for their part are a target of criticism for their European comrades. Arise directly to the level of tragedy. Notice too, Illustrations of this kind of racial prejudice can be multiplied indefinitely. Clearly, the Algerians' own view of the intensity of the repression and the frenzied character of the oppression thought they could answer the blows received without any serious problem of conscience. And there is no black who has not felt briefly or for long periods with anguish sharp or dull in varying degrees and to varying effect, simple, naked and unanswerable hatred. No black who has not wanted to smash any white face he may encounter in a day to violate out of motives of the cruelest vengeance, to break the bodies of all white people and bring them low, as low as the dust into which he himself has been and is being trampled. No black had his own adjustment, yet the adjustment must be made. Rather, it must be attempted. Do you think two minutes from the end of the World Cup final? Two minutes from the end of my career, I wanted to do that. Each decision gave rise to the same hesitation, produced the same despair. No one is free. For all that he is, people will say, he remains for us an Arab. You can't get away from nature. Big Algerian shit, dirty terrorists. When such things happen, he must grit his teeth, walk away a few steps, elude the passerby who draws attention to him, who gives other passersby the desire either to follow the example or to come to his defense. Let him do his spite. My services which I have done shall out his complaints. Big Algerian shit, dirty terrorist, nigger. That man who is forced each day to snatch his manhood, his identity out of the fire of human cruelty that rages to destroy it, knows something about himself and human life that no school on earth and indeed no church can teach. He achieves his own authority and that is unshakable. 
This is because in order to save his life, he is forced to look beneath appearances, to take nothing for granted, to hear the meaning behind the words. We hear, then we remember, the state of emergency is also always a state of emergence. At this moment, from whence came the spirit, I don't know, I resolved to fight. And suiting my action to the resolution, what we have here is not the bringing to light of a character known and frequented a thousand times in the imagination or in stories. It is the white man who creates the black man, but it is the black man who creates. This thing was there. We grasp it in the living motion. What he said touched the deepest part of me. The rebuttal assumes an original form. This endless struggle to achieve and reveal and confirm a human identity, human authority, contains, for all its horror, something very beautiful. What a return to the screen, uh, Simone. <laughs> Spot on time. Hello. <laughs> I just wanted you to see these names. I like the spectacle, you know, you disappear, you reappear. <laughs> Gotta try something when we're not together physically, huh? So everyone, if you have questions for uh, Simone, you can already start putting them into the chat section. We will start taking the question at 11 uh, and then we're just going to, you know, Simone is going to give you like a, an extra intro into more references so do write them down there and then we will do as usual you know discuss them wow. a bit thanks well in in the in light of abundance i have so much more that i cannot share and that's okay um i'm used to this from myself um <laughs> i hope it's okay with you um i would say that um if you do want some of the references that i will not share now they are in um in the documents that you did receive and you can email me at any time and we can discuss them etc so that's totally cool so just to put that out there but let me just skip quickly to some examples that i think still help think about these strategies um for example here you see i think you can see uh alexandra bell um her work is called counter narratives that's the ser series that she made she both has a background in journalism as well as uh being a visual artist and what she basically did is very simple as you can see i think is that she enlarged uh, certain articles where um it's very obvious that there's a singular voice writing the arguer argument or ar article sorry um, a singular voice creating a narrative around a certain event. So here you see, um, uh, after the shooting of Michael Brown, um, uh, this is again in North America and the US, um, there were uh, news reports in the, in the New York Times. She always uh, uh, makes the, she always creates her work. Sorry, there was something in the screen. She always creates her work uh, around the New York Times. And in this article, after uh, a cop sh uh, shot uh, a teenager with promise, Michael Brown, um, the whole article was talking about uh, uh, sort of the, the humanity of the cop, the white cop, um, and how this was a mistake and etc. And it gave him a certain face. This is how Alexandra Bell uh, interpreted the article. Then, speaking of Michael Brown, who was a high school student, uh, there was a lot of, um, uh, there was a lot in the article that talked about uh, him being, him skipping school, for example, or sometimes smoking weed. So elements that would give him almost a bad name, as if that was to give an argument for being shot, right? As if him being shot was less terrible, um, and as if the cop had some sort of reasons to shoot him. So this is how Alexander Bell read the article. And she basically, as you can see, crossed out all of the text 
that to her are um, a reproduction of a white gaze of one narrative. And this is how, what she calls counter narratives. And sometimes she also, let's see if I can go to the next. Yeah, she also replaces, for example, the pictures. So this is another uh, element, uh, another moment where um, uh, they were, when it was the, uh, the Olympics in Rio de Janeiro uh, in Brazil, there were a few US sports men who had made a, or, um, uh, a gas station. And um, this was, this was a vandalism. And it was, as you can see on the left one of your screen, um, it was reported by the New York Times. But then the picture that they put with it was from Hussein Bolt, who had won. So he had nothing to do with the vandalism at the gas station, but the picture was with this article on the gas station. And the picture was just referring to something later in the newspaper talking about Hussein Bolt's winnings. So Alexandra uh, Bell analyzed this as saying like, well, it's, uh, it's so often that the representation that comes with black men is criminality. Vandalism is dis, uh, disobedience, misbehaving. That putting this picture together with the story of vandalism creates unconsciously or consciously a narrative that we should not want to reproduce. How did this pass the chief editing? She thought, like, how did it pass the editing room? And she changed it into the right picture, uh, where you see again so much of the article is crossed out. Again, she takes this one singular voice, crosses it out, and keeps, for example, only the factual inf information. And then she also changed the, the heading, as you can see, the title of the article. Um, and she doesn't just call it a robbery or a vandalism, but says also puts in the white uh, aspect. So she says white American swimmers. And she puts actually a photo of the people who were uh, guilty of this, this vandalism. Um, so this is a way, and then she puts the, the pictures, the, the large printouts, she puts them in public space. So they're never in a white cube. They're always just in the streets. Um, so you could encounter them in Chicago or New York and uh, working in the US. I'm gonna skip this. So I'm just gonna give you a small view. Let's see what time it is. Yeah. Um, one more thing I'll mention before I give you a little exercise to chew on and then we get to the question is this book I already mentioned, Saidia Hartman. Um, this is her newest book, uh, Way More Lives Beautiful Experiment. And just to give you a quick account is that she is a historian, she's a scholar, and she talks about uh, black women's lives um, in the 1900s in the US again, sorry for this na narrow geography that I'm giving you, um, where the, the, the lives of black women in that time were completely policed when if in any case they were dissident. So dissident could mean not being married, it could mean being in queer relationships, it could mean having intergenerational relationships, so an older person with a younger person. Um, and especially not being married could be enough to be uh, policed, uh, criminalized as a sex worker. So what happens of these lives of the women that she described is that they're only described by uh, police reports, and by correctional facilitators. Uh, also white women would take black women who were disobedient in the house and have them work as a maid. This would be a way to put them on the straight path. So what Saidia Hartman does as a historian is that she recognizes that if she uses the usual ways of creating a narrative of history, she will not account for the lives of these women. Because what she will use is police reports. What she will use are uh, documents that we are taught to use when we narrate history, because we are supposed to, to uh, uh, use written documents, because we, we privilege written documents over, for example, oral stories um, or fragmented stories. Um, but she says, well, I cannot, I cannot narrate the lives of these women around 1900 
the black women if I use these police reports, because they're always one-sided and they're always talking about these women as if they are a problem. So she uses, as a, as a scholar and historian, she uses her imagination and she fantasizes. She has some incentives and some hypotheses that she can use, but from that she fantasizes about their queer intimacies, um, about their sometimes also non-monogamous or polyamorous intimacies. And I think I'm, I'm bringing this up because um, I really like the idea of using non-professional um, strategies in the sense of that if you, for example, identify with a certain practice, say you're a musician, bringing in something that does not belong to the musician's practice is also a way of recreating the tradition of the practice that you inhabit. And of course, this is a way of rewriting history, right? Okay, so we're out of time, but I'm gonna give you a little exercise that you can take and do maybe in 10 years, because now you're very busy with the University of the Underground. And I just wanna share this with you. Um, as I call it, predicting the future as a healing practice. And I'm saying this predicting the future, not because you're gonna fantasize about the future, um, and how it could potentially be, but because you take your current moment and you take your own personal past and you bring it into the future. What do I mean with that? Here you see Adrian Piper. Uh, she made these two works. Adrian Piper is a visual artist, a uh, performance artist, um, now living in Berlin. Uh, she made these My Calling Cards, as she called them, and she would have them with her um and they are like business cards right the ones that you hand out uh before the internet um i don't know that wasn't there um it says uh you can read it yourself um basically it's making people aware of the offenses that she experiences in daily life right i'm, I'm just reading the shortest one i think the, the upper one is actually uh the first one and, and it's very important um but here she says, I'm dear friend. For example, she's sitting at the bar. She's saying, dear friend, I'm not here to pick anyone up, to be picked up. I'm here alone because I want to be here alone. This card is not intended as part of an extended flirtation. Thank you for respecting my privacy. So what we see here is that you take some experience from your current moment and you know that it's gonna happen again. If you are identified as a woman by other people, you know that sitting at the bar alone is not something that uh, ever happens <laughs> in the sense that you will be um, uh, spoken to. So from that experience, you create for a, a future moment, you create a defense. And by putting that out and, and um, bringing in your future, by your, your current experience, you're in a way changing the future as well. Because what happens upon you, you already know that it's gonna happen upon you and you change it. Um, I think I'm rushing through this a little bit, so I hope it's clear. What I would propose as an exercise usually in this, in this workshop is that you take a curse or an offense that you have often heard um, and you start writing it down. This is somebody, Paul Budebaum, a student. It says flicker, 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 which is um, a, the translation of faggot. Um, and he started writing all the times that he was called faggot. And he didn't stop at the moment that he could not remember those times anymore when he was called faggot. He continued into the future because he knew that living in the world that we live in currently, he would continue hearing this curse. Now, what I do in the exercise is that I actually take one of those curses and I do this quite often myself. You take the curse, you repeat it, you repeat it, you remember. It's also a memory exercise. And then you go into the future. So the next time, that somebody will call you the curse. So will somebody will call you the F word in this sense. You actually say you're part of my narrative. Instead of hap it happening upon you, you're saying 
I've already written you and your curse in my script. So I hope that makes sense as a sense of ownership of the future. And it, 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 that it makes sense in, instead of it happening upon you, you've already written it down. Okay, that's it for thank now. Thank you so much, Simon. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so everyone, this is the time to ask your question to Simone. Am I, is my sound really bad? Um, so I'm seeing, I don't know, Simone, can you see your screen? If you go in the chat section, you should see some comments, yeah. some reference as well that we'll share with you. Um, you know, no. seems like everybody really enjoyed the work of Alexandra Bell, I believe was her name. Um, so I'm just saying, mm. rolling through it. There was a question actually by uh, Liam that I seen at the beginning. Liam, are you here? Warren, where are you? Liam, if you're still with us. Something about the, uh, Liam Warren, are you there? Uh, yeah, hello. Hello. It was yeah, I mean, I think it was kind of, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it was kind of, answer when you were talking about uh capitalism later on as like a way of um accumulating uh memory but um yeah when you were talking about uh straight uh, straight memory or straight uh so i forgot the straight time right. i can see your question uh yeah straight time um yeah i mean you were talking about ownership and the passing of ownership. And I was just wondering if, yeah, I guess that could be kind of linked historically to the agricultural revolution. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I guess maybe more of a comment than a question, but, um, and then you kind of, yeah, I don't know. It was more of a comment than a question. Mm. <laughs> so well, basically, my, the, the comment was that a uh, straight time is somewhat linked to the agriculture agricultural revolution that was the comment right correct okay yeah so we have a comment from uh, louise as well i don't know if you're there louise about the uh, tate modern actually i don't know if you've seen about the statue section so sorry i'm coming back from the top of the chat section so you know that was when you were talking about statues uh, and statues being louise do you want to yes. tell us about that yeah um, yeah, I don't know, Simone, if you've heard of it or if you've seen it. Kara Walker? Yeah, her commission yeah. for the Turbine Hall. Uh, I wanted to know if you had any like point of view on, onto this, uh, especially by the fact that you talked about statue as a, as a mean of uh, translating those messages in plurality of history. Mm -hmm. So if you have any comment on this one. Ooh, yeah, so many. Um, I've seen Kara Walker's uh, uh, statue or recreation of statues in the Tate Modern in London. Uh, and I think you should definitely all look it up uh, if you haven't seen it. Um, yeah, my first comment would be that, I mean, I, I, she also has a podcast about, she speaks about uh, the creation of this statue. And basically it's, it's a sort of overt, grotesque, almost carnivalesque representation of the way that white history is narrated through statues. Right? And she also talks about this in a text. And I, I'm, I'm a deep fan of Carol Walker's work, actually. Um, and the reason I'm saying so much is because I have an immediate emotional effect uh, and response to your question, because I've seen, I've seen it in the Tate, but what would happen is that there was a lot of families because the Tate is free <laughs> and people would go on Saturday um, afternoon and they just hang out in the museum and people were taking pictures uh, at the, the fountain as if it is like the Trevi fountain in, in um, is it in Rome? No. Yeah. Yeah. Florence. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> is uh, as if it is, you know, one of those fountains where tourists take pictures and I saw a lot of children playing with it and I really, I really, enjoyed it as an image of how people interact with these kind of statues and fountains and that they do not seem to be impacted by the heaviness of history at all but it was also very painful and there is one representation of a uh, woman uh, representing an enslaved woman who crossed the transatlantic um, and she's in a shell 
So it's, uh, it's not Venus arriving on the shell, right, this, this image. Um, um, but it's her being in the shell and she's crying and there's water coming out of her eyes. And that one asked for the viewer to come close and to be quiet with it. And it was really interesting also to see the behavior of the audience being so different with that one. Like a lot of people just passed it and were not, you know, like taking all these photos with it. And yeah, I think, I don't know if this is an answer, right? But it's, it's, it's this question of overt, obvious presence versus sort of disguising and making may, maybe even Ill, illegible or opaque Right, this concept of opacity by, by uh, a glissant, where you're, you're saying that you don't have to be transparent, you don't have to be visible, you don't have to be obvious about what you want to c communicate. Because once you do, often it's subsumed by the usual way of listening, by the usual way of seeing. And yeah, that would be my response for now. Thank oh, you thank for you. So Simone, yesterday we had Jeremy Deleur that spoke about reenactment a lot. You know, a big part of his work is about reenactment. He reenact, you know, the, uh, the mining uh, riot. He reenact, I mean, you know, he, he's reenacted a big part of, you know, British history and actually brought in, you know, reenactment and reenactors, you know, in the process to kind of like bring a new light on some element of histories. Uh, and I wonder what the, you know, because you mentioned different ways and methods that we can kind of develop counter-narrative. Uh, is there, you know, is reenactment one that you are interested in? Do you think that this is uh, a good mean by which you can kind of develop plurality as well? Or do you think that reenactment is maybe not a very useful you know, method um, when it comes to like developing a practice or to kind of like really reflect on the past. Yeah, no, I think that's super interesting. I think one way is what do we expect of the reenactment? So I do not, I would not say I'm a fan of creating empathy. I'm not a fan of creating empathy anyway, because it always has this idea that there is the other and you have to get empathy for the other. And I'm saying this because it reminds me, your comment um, reminds me also of, for example, the um, um, AI and um, how do you call the glasses again? The, the a a VR? Uh, that's the visual reality. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kaspar. For reality. Um, for example, they've used that um, in uh, commemorating Second World War, but also they use it, uh, 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 for example, um, in activist circles where you, with virtual reality, you walk through a crowd of anti-abortion protesters. So here it's this, and, they, and they, they give this kind of virtual reality to people who are anti-abortion in order to get empathy for the people who they are against. So I'm just thinking about that in terms of reenactment, um, the virtual reality reenactment, which I think is quite flourishing at the moment or is used as a way of commemoration. They also use it in high schools now. Um, as opposed to embodied reenactment, uh, yes, and I would definitely say, I think, again, like, what is the expectation of it? If we expect that uh, we reenact to feel similar to something, I don't think that's a good methodology. If we reenact to understand the performativity of a kind of being, then I think it's becoming interesting. So, for example, I'm also thinking about drag. Uh, I, I was present to Sky's talk yesterday. Uh, thinking about the the ballroom uh, acting or the drag right where you 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 inhabit or embody for a moment an office uh, a white collar office person for example and you the drag is not in any way to think that you are a person in the working in the office it's actually to think that you are not it's saying that you are artificially claiming a certain role and I think for me, that's a very, I'm really interested in this idea of reenactment. I've also used it in my own work, uh, elements of drag, uh, for example, following a court hearing, 
um, a court hearing that lasted for many weeks and uh, uh, was the trial against uh, Geert Wilders, who is a right-wing politician in the Netherlands. And then I would, for example, come in drag. So I would drag myself up to look like Geert Wilders. And this was not in any way to think that by dragging up or like dressing up uh, and looking like somebody, I could understand that person. It's actually to, it's not to, how do you say it? Like, it's not to conflate yourself with the experience or with the person, but it's actually to detach and to understand the gestural aspect of behavior. So, and to, to understand it as a performance. So you never become someone. So I think that through reenactment, it's not about becoming someone, or it's not about becoming part of the history of the Second World War, if that's the reenactment that you're doing. But it's about understanding that there's always a performativity to any moment, and even in a historical moment. You have some more even a, a moment that seems from looking at it now is so sorry. I was just saying, Simone, you have some more questions, and I'm aware of the time. So sorry, yeah, yeah. So you have a uh, uh, Yamali. Am I pronouncing your name right, Yamali? Do you want to ask a question? I don't know if you're still with us. Shea Mali, Sudesh. Hi, hi. Can you yeah. hear me? Yes. Hey. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask a question about um, Adrian Piper's work and um, what you think about like the effectiveness of not responding to racism and not preparing for future abuse um, so that the person that's being a, like kind of attacked or whatever is not having to do that emotional labor all the time and um and like kind of always having to prepare for what might happen to them based on the past and that also being quite empowering as well yeah um firstly i would say that indeed the distribution of who has to respond to certain violence has to be redistributed right so indeed it has not it should not be on people of color to respond to racism all the time that's that's one sort of political element to it in in relation to adrian piper's work i think that it is it is this sort of tension and balance between a realism where you're saying this always happens to me and it's probably going to happen again instead of thinking instead of negating that it's not going to happen again because it will happen again preparing yourself through a certain work so the business cards become a work where in the, as I see it, she's doming, dominating or um, bossing over the narrative, the racist narrative that, complete, that, that, that always is inflicted upon her. So she still has to respond to it, right? There's still an element of response by having these cards. But in a way, the creation from her personal history of experiencing that also gives a small incentive to create a different situation in the moment that is that it that is again inflicted upon her because the tension sh shifts at the moment that the white person for example approaching her or not realizing that she is part black that this moment they become aware possibly you hope <laughs> um of the sort of reproductive behavior that they are showing or the repetitious behavior that they are actually part of a lineage right and this is the problem of course that white people are not seeing themselves as part of a lineage and she's basically creating the script by these cards and saying darling not even are you bothering me but you're so boring i've seen this so many times and I think that the, the tension that I hear in your question or the, the tension that I think that Adrian Piper takes up is that, okay, of course you'd, you'd wish not, there's also an arrogance in these business cards, right? It's like, or that's how I interpret it. But at the same, so it's this tension between having to work with it and having to respond to it, unfortunately, and doing it in a, in a, in a generative way. But that, to me, does not in any way negate that the work of anti-racism should not be on those people who are experiencing racism all the time. And the fatigue of that, 
and the tiredness. This is something that Evan Ifakoya also addresses in their sound work. Because they, they make it into a healing meditation and a healing practice, mostly for black people and uh, people of color. Um, because there is no healing time and there is no rest if white people are not taking up this work. So you have some more questions. I don't know how much more time we can, uh, like, let's just try and like recap. So we have like one question by Patty, and then I just seen that Rupert. And uh, no, makes a miss. Uh, maybe we can just really quickly have Patty and Rupert go both the one after the other, and then Simone, you can try and, you know, prove like you know, use both sides uh, and then respond to both. Sides. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, let's see, Patty. So at what point does a plurality of voices um, erase the work itself? For me, it's quite sad when a work that is so vigorously plural um, fails to communicate to those who the work speaks to and perhaps bring about change, but also on the flip side, it doesn't matter. Mm. And then yeah, one as well, we can, you know, repair to where are you? You can also read us, tell us your... Yeah, hi. No, I was just thinking, um, like this idea of monument, and I love this idea of like rubble being left, and I guess that's sort of connected yesterday to Jeremy Della's um, the, the car from from Baghdad that he took through America. But I was just thinking about sort of ephemeral forms of um, uh, of, of collective um, narratives, such as like myth in ancient Greece, and how that's always through like our history has sort of become this device. And I wonder whether there's a new way. There's ways of building a new sort of type of or, um, myth. Um, or I don't know if myth would even be the right word again, because it implies so much historically, but yeah, it's just a thought. Mm. Um, the ephemerality of um, collective consciousness um, through set things. But then of course, it, I think it's problematic because it implies sort of religiosity and I say it's passing on, you know, myth is something that it passes on, mm. but it's almost like a, an object that can be seen from many angles. Um, so I was just thinking aloud really. Um, offering that thought. I wonder if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it relates to the previous question in a way is that this ephemerality, right? Like the passing of of something. Um, and again, for the myth, I will refer again to Evan Fekoya um, and their work. Um, yeah, I think this idea of like, who, what if it becomes so illegible that it doesn't speak anymore to? I think that for me, I would shift the question to how do we listen? How do we listen in such a way that we become more open and understanding of illegibility? So that the question is not so much on the, the artist who creates the work, who speaks, for example, if we're talking about an artistic context, it's not so much on who speaks, but on all these people are, who are listening. Like, how do we, how do we, uh, how do we create an expectation of understanding? I think sometimes it's already um, in, in expecting. So again, also the abundance, like expecting that you can understand what is illegible, illegible. And that if you do not understand that it's also fine. I think that is already uh, one mode because there is always this question of if it's something is illegible for you, was it actually speaking to you? And then there's also a question of simplicity, like whose simplicity, right? Like if I'm explaining something, if I am explaining, if Adrian Piper is explaining what she is explaining on her calling cards, this is a boring knowledge to her because she has experienced this many times. It might seem new to someone else. It might be even like, what are you talking about for a moment? So it's also, when I talk about illegibility, it's also in a way an activist proposition of allowing for that space, especially when you do inhabit uh, marginalized positions where you continuously have to simplify the knowledges that you inhabit in order to communicate it to a so-called larger public or to communicate it to the traditional or the normative or the mainstream um, discourse which I'd 
least this is how I view it as well. If I encounter work that I find illegible, that to me seems illegible, I feel touched on the level where I long for a complexity that I do not often see around. Because we have this idea, this philosophy of clarity and a sort of singular uh, narration. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm. Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so we, we're going to uh, stop it here. Simone, I'm so grateful for your time. Thank you for, you know, generously as well, answering all of the questions uh, after, you know, after your class. Thank you so much for that. And we, we will have two more classes from you. Uh, I can't remember when, but it is definitely in the Canada. And everyone, you know that I usually email you all the program again with any updates at the end of the week. Uh, but I think, do you have more classes this week? I can't remember. Yes, on Friday. Yeah. On Friday, okay. Uh, yeah. What time is your class on Friday? Do you know? Two. 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 Okay, yeah. so you have one more class with Simone at two, and there is a class with Sky today at two, and there will be as well a class with Speeches Christ, with uh, one of our board members and uh, a pretty legendary drag queen, uh, and she will be with us at 7 p.m. because, of course, she is based in California, so the times are... Uh, quite different. So today there is two more classes, one at two and one at seven. Thank you all uh, and have a good meal, a good rest of the morning and we we'll see you later. Thank you so much Simone. Bye-bye. Thank you so much everyone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye-bye.